Somehow, we make it just in time to the treatment center. Hours of operation range from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Ten minutes have passed since we arrived, but I make it my plan not to watch the clock. Since it's an emergency, that should be allowed. I asked Shurio earlier to contact the doctor and waited in the coach up until now. Minutes later, an old man who seems better suited in judo uniform than a doctor's white coat steps out from the building, a face full of stubble and all. It's a bear. A bear arrived. Although I liken him to a bear, his cheeks are puffed up like a squirrel's while chewing. He must have been a bear in his past life. No doubt about it. Not only that, his name is Kumario Baird. Shurio stands next to the bear, I mean next to the bear-like doctor, and opens the coach's door. The doctor has to bend over to fit through the coach's doorway. He's still munching on something. Ah, just when I thought I could start my dinner an emergency happens, whoa. After seeing me, his eyes pop. Where are you surprised me? What's the matter, young master Lian? Huh, W what? What's happening? For some reason, he's in a state of confusion. I just ignore it. It's a good thing I made it in time, I say. No, you actually didn't. I was just talking out of reflex before. Hours of operation are over. I was eating dinner. I'm sorry about this, doctor. Although it's rude of me to say this, I want you to examine someone. Examine who? You. No, Alfred. Alfred, whoa. Isn't this the unsocial shitty brat from the church's orphanage? I'm really surprised now. The bear-like doctor widens his eyes once more. Stop being so surprised all the time. Please examine him quickly. He has a terrible fever. Oh oh. The doctor sits down next to me and begins diagnosing Alfred. Despite the coach being large enough to fit three people comfortably, the doctor's huge body takes up a lot of space. His wounds, what happened to him? He collapsed on the road. Oh. He shoots me an inquisitive look. What is he staring at me for? Got any complaints? I tear my gaze away to look at Alfred. It'd be a pain in the ass to explain the situation. So, how is it? What's his condition? Oh oh, yep. This must be what they call, magic power. Magic power. Yep. This guy has crazy magic potential. He's just going through his growth spurt right now. That's what the fever is from. I've seen this a lot back at the royal capital. The bodies would become unstable and they'd have trouble controlling how much magic they'd let out. As they continue to produce and accumulate magic power, they'd fall flat on the faces. But this is the first time I've seen this since coming back to the village. Oh yeah, now that he mentioned it, I remember something. Alfred did tell me before that he had trouble controlling his strength. Did the symptoms start since then? Even in the game, there were times when the hero's power ran wildly. I wonder if it's similar to what happened here. In the game, his power always ran wild whenever his feelings heightened, but it was never explained properly. So it was actually a real condition with a name, huh? All right, wait a minute. I should have some magic suppressing medicine from the royal capital, mumbles the bear, no, the bear-like doctor as he heads back for the clinic. After a while, the doctor returns with a small paper bag of prescription drugs and a glass of water. He then pushes them onto me. Here, this is it. Have him take one pill with every meal until tomorrow evening. If he takes one now, he'll feel a lot better tomorrow. Quote. I see. My shoulders finally relax from the wave of relief. He'll have a full recovery. Thank goodness. Seriously. I'm so glad I brought him here. Thank goodness there's medicine for what he has. Can you help him drink? Oh. Okay. Sitting down by Alfred, I help support his torso and tilt his head up slightly. He's still unconscious. Sweat soaks through his tattered clothes. He looks racked in pain. I retrieve one of the pills from the doctor, pry Alfred's lips open, and slip it inside. Then I gently pour some water into his mouth. Drink, Alfred. It's medicine. You'll feel better after. No response. He's still not awake, so I wonder if he can actually swallow. His throat is moving though. No clue if it's a conditioned reflex or a physiological phenomenon. After I voice my doubts, the bear-like doctor grasps Alfred's chin, peering into the opening of his mouth. Oh, should be fine. There's nothing left in his mouth. If he did then that's good. Feeling a gaze on me, I raise my head and see the bear-like doctor looking at me, pitch black irises narrowing with a smile. W what? I say. Him. Oh, nothing. I just felt deeply in my heart that young master Leanne has sure changed. I'm shocked. But somehow, I am able to hide this. 
Just now, the way he spoke was not his usual, crude way. It's thoughtlessly intimate and super unnatural, an unpleasant way of speaking. Like he is amused. Like he is teasing me. W what are you going on about? Nothing has changed, I say. But the doctor is persistent. No, no. Something definitely did. You've become really gentle. The previous young master Leanne absolutely wouldn't have helped a shitty brat lying on the side of the road. And no, but in the end I swallow my words. He's completely right. Just like he said, Leanne would not have saved the unconscious Alfred. In fact, it'd be safe to say he viewed the poor as dirty and idiotic, a source of much scorn for him. The right thing to do as Leanne would have been to feign ignorance and leave Alfred where he was. That's what I think, but. But. Although I'm aware of and have seen what I should and should not do, I just couldn't leave him by himself. He suffered so greatly. And he's injured too. All this while having a fever. No one came for him. He had lain in such a dark and cold place but no one came for him. He was there on his own until morning. He was in terrible pain, all alone. The unpleasant smile on the doctor's face disappears without a trace. Lowering his brows to the shape of a ha he scratches his head with a troubled expression. No. Sorry. I'm sorry. I blundered with my words. I'm not blaming you, so don't make that face. No, that's right. I was impressed. Yes. I was full of admiration toward you. Now I have a better opinion of you. A decent guy, that's what I think. Once again, I want to rebuke him. Is he really complimenting me? For some reason, I don't feel that was the case. It basically means I failed to act like Leanne. Playing this role is no walk in the park. Our personalities are too different. Inevitably, bits and pieces of my true self shine through the cracks, and I can't act the way I want. I know that. I'm aware of that but. This is just too difficult for me, Koikiro. I heard it would be fun to literally walk in someone else's shoes, Leon's, in this case. But I don't think so. I just can't understand the selfishness and thought patterns of the rich. I am a common person through and through. And now my stomach keeps hurting too. Not only that, but with the goddess's request, this has become all the more depressing and too heavy of a burden. Yes, yes. Thank goodness, thank goodness, mutters the doctor, crossing his arms and nodding. I'm relieved. I was worried about the future of this village with the next lord being a hedonistic good for nothing, but now it somehow feels bright. Peeping in from outside, Shorio smiles wryly with a troubled expression. I won't tell him to be quiet, but Shorio may be thinking the same thing as me. I mean, isn't the village lord's successor my elder brother? I definitely feel bummed out. And anxious. What would happen to this village in the future? No matter what I do, I keep thinking about this out of reflex. If young master Leanne is around, I have peace of mind. It's useless. This is bad. I'll be troubled if you're relieved by this. P please don't overestimate me, I say, throwing my arms up in the air. Thank you for examining him. How much will this cost? Bent on finishing this conversation, I pull out my wallet from my pocket. Oh, oh, that's right, that medicine is very valuable. The price is a little outrageous, so will it be okay? Please don't fuss over me. Unlike you, I'm loaded. I want to say something unpleasant. Just to put myself back on track in the role of Leanne. Arching one of his eyebrows, the doctor snorts. The price is certainly high. It makes sense since the medicine is special and this world has no health insurance. Even so, it doesn't change the fact that the cost is a burden. This kind of sum would be painful for anyone else in the village. But for me, for Leanne, it is doable. Well, it may be. If an ordinary villager is the customer, the doctor probably would have charged a more reasonable amount. I heard from the aunties in the village that he takes so little payment, it actually makes them feel bad. I don't know if this is the actual price or if he raised it because it was me paying. Well, it's fine. I think it's a normal reaction. Because of their arrogant personalities, Leanne's family, Leanne included, hold the villagers' dislike. Anyway, I pay the said amount. That seems to surprise the doctor. What the heck? I paid the proper amount, so what's with that strange expression? Does he want to complain? If he's going to say it's still not enough, I'll really get mad. I don't need change, I say. A. N. No, wait that's not it. Seriously. I didn't expect you to pay, A. No, W. Wait a second. Is it really okay? This is such a large sum. It's fine. Isn't this an expensive drug? 
Well then, I'm in a rush so I'll excuse myself. He stands there bewildered for some reason. Pushing his shoulder, I urge him to disembark. But he won't get off. It's crowded in here, so hurry up and get off you bastard. H hey. Wait a moment young master. Wrong. I was wrong. I'll return half of this payment, whoa. I shove his back. The bear-like doctor loses his footing and falls on his behind. Oh ouch. What did you do that for? A refund is unnecessary, I say. Please put that to good use. I flash my usual smile. Full of impertinence. My money comes from taxes levied on the village. This way, it would actually do some good. In any case, he better use it well. I'd be troubled if he went bankrupt. Shurio. Start the carriage. The horses resume the trot. Sitting in the driver's seat, he shoots a quick glance behind him. Young master, um, where do you want to go? Take me to the church. Shurio looks at me and smiles. What's with that? It's a smile, but I have a bad feeling about it. U-G-H-H. Shit. Placing Alfred's head on my lap, I consider my options as the coach shakes with every bump. Until now, I haven't come up with a good plan. So tired. My brain's shutting down. Is it going on strike? How brave. Don't screw around. Keep working, brain. Suddenly, I hear a soft groan. I quickly leave my thoughts and look down on my lap. His brows are furrowed and he's sweating profusely. His breathing is irregular, rough, a moan. He seems to be having a terrible nightmare. His arm trembles as he raises it in the air, wandering about. It is almost as if he were searching for something. 1. Alfred. What is it? As expected, he doesn't respond. Huh. Is he still sleeping? Someone. Who? Was he trying to tell someone to come? Was he looking for someone? Someone. It's unclear who Alfred is looking for. Slowly, his hand sinks back down. As though he gave up. It falls to his chest. His breathing becomes painful. Ah. I understand. Yeah. I feel like I understand. That's because I was in a similar situation years ago. It happened during a high fever, when I was asleep. No one else was home. I was all alone. Even though I knew no one was home, I still called out for someone. I knew it, knew that I had no one, but I still called out. Somebody, please help me. The people who had been by my side since the beginning no longer existed in this world. He's a bit like me. Both of us have no family. Both of us have no parents or adults to rely on. Both have to live alone. After repeating I was fine alone in my mind like a mantra, somehow I struck an odd sort of balance, and had been doing this ever since. Nevertheless, I managed to do it. Although I have to rely on myself, I am definitely fine. An easy victory. Compared to most people I'm stronger, so it's okay. That's what I told myself. That's how it was supposed to be, but... As my body grew weak back then, my heart also grew weak, and I unconsciously called out for someone. Somebody, anybody would do. I wanted him to hold my hand. To tell me everything would be alright. An adult, or my parents. But I'm already past that sort of sentimental period. It'll be okay. I pat Alfred's hand. You'll be okay because everything is fine now. I try to grasp his hand lightly. I did this because I once wanted someone to do this for me as well. No response. No actions besides sweating buckets and breathing heavily. That said, I receive a strong squeeze back. I thought he woke up, but his eyes remain closed. Even if he springs awake now, I'd still be troubled. Sorry, but if you can, please stay asleep until we reach the church. His grasp is strong enough to hurt my fingers, but I don't pull away. Please reign in your absurd strength. Little by little, the wrinkles in his brow fade. The rough, irregular breathing calms as well. At last, it seems the medicine's effects have taken place. Yeah, that's right. Alfred is still a child. Although he gives off the aura of an adult, he is only 14 years old. I'd never given it any thought. He acts like he's grown up and wears a cool expression, but he's just a kid. I'm sure he's actually insecure, worried about himself and his future. Because that was how I felt back then. Read this at perpetualdaydreams.com. Once the coach arrives at the church's entrance, and after Shorio hoists Alfred's body into his arms, it's too heavy for me, I bang on the door. I knock several times. At the sound of a woman's voice and footsteps, the door slowly swung open. Out pops an old nun who is shorter than me. Her cheeks are as red as apples and she stands straight as she takes in the sight of me. Her name should be Marianne. Or Marie Sama, as the villagers call her. 
Good evening, Ms. Marie. Please excuse me. As I greeted her, eyes that resemble thin threads open, revealing irises a light shade of cocoa. Yes, good evening, A. Eh? Huh. Oh dear. Could this be Mr. Lian? Welcome to our church. Well, um, how is everything? Fine. Granny Marie's eyes tremble with uneasiness. Yep. I understand her reaction. I really do. It's because of Lian's father, the Lord. There are so many terrible stories about him. Things he said included the following, that there were complaints that the orphans were too rowdy so she should stop taking in so many, that it would be such a waste of the church's large space not to destroy one section and make it into a vineyard, that the church's donation management was too hard on her so he should handle it. He really isn't painted in a good light. I shake my head in denial. No. Alfred had collapsed on the road so I brought him here. He did. He collapsed. Oh, after all, these days he seemed unwell, so I said that if he felt sick he should stay home. Ah, so he really was in bad condition. That guy acts like he finds it troublesome but he's actually serious enough about school to come even when sick. Noticing Alfred in Shurio's arms, Marie approaches him full of worry and tilts her gaze upward. Thank you for your help. Izal. Please don't worry. He's all right now. He's taken medicine and is resting. Is that so? Oh, thank you so much. I really mean it. How can I repay you? There's no need for that. Well then, let's bring him to his room. Shurio. Will you do that? Yes. Marie Sama, which one is it? Oh. But, s yes, sorry, then, can I take you up on your offer? I smile and nod. Of course, I doubt such a thin granny can carry him. Relieved, Marie returns my smile. Oh, that really helps me. Thank you very much, really. I will let this child guide you. After calling out behind her, a naughty looking boy with a bruised face appears. He leads Shurio into the church. A gaggle of small children follow them, eyes sparkling with curiosity. Now Lian Sama, after you, says Marie. No, I. Oh my. Please don't hold yourself back. Today's different from usual. It's as cold as winter. So please warm yourself up with some tea before you leave. And I'm pushed further inside. Not wanting to shove a small body, I allow myself to be pushed inside the church. Oh yeah, pass this along for me. Before I forget, I retrieve the prescribed pills from my pocket. It's medicine. Please make sure he takes one pill at every meal. This should calm his condition. Once again, Marie's squinty eyes widen. Oh my, what is this? Thank you. However, in the blink of an eye, her expression dims. It's an unfortunate story, but we cannot afford this medicine. So we can only accept your good intentions. She smiles apologetically, pushing the bag back toward me. The pills are very expensive. As such, I understand what Marie is hinting at. But I shake my head. No, I don't need payment. Please accept this. Yes, that's right. Yeah, this is a donation. Therefore, please put it to good use. If I label it as a donation, then she is sure to accept it. Because this is a church. Marie opens her mouth and drops her gaze on me. And I press the bag of medicine back toward her. Ill at ease with my refusal, she hesitates, thin hands littered with wrinkles shaking as they receive the package. I is it really okay for me to take such an expensive thing free of charge? Yep. But I do have one request. A request? Yes. Please don't reveal that I brought him back here, and that this medicine is from me. Tell the children to keep it a secret too. Especially to Alfred. Absolutely don't speak of this in front of him. A. Hey, please. Otherwise, I'll be concerned. Gazing at me motionlessly, she tilts her head as she succumbs to her thoughts. Ah, could it be? Oh my. She mutters. Light cocoa eyes widen and sparkle. You um. Those apple-like cheeks flush redder, a smile spreading across her lips. Ah, the revelation I had from my dream, this must be it. Why yes. I've no clue what she is talking about. Revelation from a dream. I wonder what that means. Is this in the game's plot? No, it isn't. It shouldn't have existed. A revelation from a dream. Yes. That's right. Approximately two years ago, a goddess entered my dream and spoke to me. Ha. Huh. Goddess. No way. Don't tell me it's that airheaded goddess. She said in the future, someone would appear in the village to teach and guide Al. That person would be very kind and have hair like spun silver. She asked me to help that person when he arrives. I stop breathing for a moment. W wait, goddess. H-E-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y. What the heck? You should have filled me in sooner. 
Someone in this village is actually cooperating with me. If I had known this, I would have come to this church sooner. Moreover, she had been told about me since the beginning. Why in the world have I been suffering from stress alone and drowning myself in stomach medicine all this time? Damn it. I'll seriously sue for workers' compensation. I'll suck every last penny out of you. After that, the goddess said there was a deep reason for all of this, and that I should not reveal this situation to Al or anyone else. However, there's no need to worry about it since that person will lead the world in a good direction. She said to please believe in that person, and help him. Ha ha ha. Did she really say that? Yes. I feel my strength melt away. This person can freely talk about my troubled circumstances when even I can't quite comprehend them. I can't believe she's been here all this time. I close my eyes. I am exhausted, unable to tell anyone what I had to deal with, with nobody to rely on. It's incredibly tough. I don't know what I can do with this old body, but I will try my best. So please tell me anything. I will do whatever I can to help. You can assist me. Yes. Of course. She breaks into a warm smile. I couldn't tell anyone, I was alone. Yes, yes. I understand. Lian Sama, no, you are a heavenly assistant who borrowed Lian's figure, aren't you? A heavenly assistant. No, I'm. Marie's expression reflects understanding and she nods. It's all right. You received an important mission from the goddess and descended to this village. And it's a secret to everyone. Oh, how exciting. No, it's more like it's wonderful. To think there'd be a time that I can meet the goddess's assistant. Granny wheezes heavily from excitement. Hold on a second. Don't act like you understand. You don't understand anything Granny. I mean, the mission shouldn't have been that big of a deal in the first place. It was supposed to have been a simple task. I definitely said I would only help with small things. As such, I am a victim deceived by the goddess. I rub my face with my hands. This misunderstanding needs to be corrected. The mission isn't that impressive. I'm just a little helper. A-H-E-L-P-E-R, I say, stressing that part. Is that so? Yes. But, I must do it. Otherwise, everyone in the village, including me, would perish. Only I know this. And in four years, the night of that tragedy would strike. I thought I could only consult with myself regarding what to do in that event. At times, I was so racked with anxiety I had trouble falling asleep. But now, I am no longer alone in this. Now there is someone I could talk to. This is huge. Not only that, but it's great for my mental and emotional health. I am so relieved that my knees give out in front of me. Heavenly assistant. Are you all right? Marie prods my knees in a panic. While watching carefully, she strokes my back. I I'm okay. Also, can you please stop calling me a heavenly assistant, um. Since the goddess said all of that to you, that means it's all right to tell you everything, right? To those words, Marie nods approvingly. Yes, of course. Tell me anything. And don't you worry. I'll keep everything you say between the two of us. I swear it in the name of the goddess. Is that so? Hanging my head in shame, I cover my eyes with my hands. I'm so pathetic. I must be firm. Unlike Alfred, I am already an adult. On the inside, anyway. Please don't worry about everything by yourself anymore. I'm always in the church, so please swing by any time. With her small body, Marie hugs me gently. The hands that stroke my back reassuringly are too warm. I keep my eyes shut, unable to raise my face. Translated by Sleep Chaser. TLCED by Chiazaholic. Legacy Translator Note.